Hey, it's Andrew Huang. Today's video is about the number one most mind-blowing thing I've ever learned about music. It's absolutely fundamental to how sound works and why we like the music we like, but a lot of people never learn about it. Even people like me, growing up in a musical family, learning lots of different instruments, studying music theory, I never even encountered this concept until I was 18 and went to university for music. What we're talking about is the harmonic series. Have a listen. The pitches in this series occur in nature, they're completely consistent, and they're quietly audible almost any time you hear a musical note. So every note is actually a whole bunch of tiny notes put together, with one exception that we'll also take a look at. I guess it's really notable. <laughs> Note, whenever you play a note, you'll be hearing a mix of these higher, quieter notes along with it, which we call harmonics or overtones. And I should clarify that it's not necessarily the exact pitches you heard in our example. The harmonics are all gonna be relative to whatever note you're playing. And there's a very simple pattern behind that. Basically, every time you play a note, you're also gonna be hearing a little bit of the frequency that's twice as fast, and a little bit of the frequency that's three times as fast, and the one that's four times as fast, five times as fast, six times, seven times, eight times. All of the integer multiples of that original note's frequency Theoretically to infinity, but in reality, only the first handful are really audible. So let's take a look at this bass guitar. The whole length of this string is vibrating, and that's what determines what note we hear. But it's also simultaneously vibrating in other modes. Here's a little diagram to illustrate. So you've got the main loudest note that you hear, the fundamental, and that is vibrating the whole length of the string. So if you picture this string wobbling back and forth, that wave is traveling all the way down the length of the string and all the way back. What we're also hearing quieter is the integer multiples of that wave. So we're hearing the wave that's twice as fast, and we're hearing the wave that's three times as fast, and so on. The same kind of thing happens in wind instruments where it's a certain length column of air that's resonating. So these additional waves are the harmonics, and depending on your instrument, on its design, on its shape and size, also on the way that you play it, the volume of these different harmonics can be quite different. That's why plucking a string towards its end sounds different than plucking it closer towards the middle. By plucking it in different places, the additional modes of vibration, the harmonics, may be strengthened or weakened. That's also why two different instruments playing the exact same note can sound completely different. The main note that they're playing, the lowest one, the fundamental, is actually completely identical, and it's just the mixture of harmonics that give each instrument its own unique character. So for example, check this out, I've got a clarinet and a guitar both playing an F here. Very easy to tell which is which, even though they're playing these tiny little notes. Let's check them out in a spectrum analyzer. Firstly, I hope you're noticing all the harmonics showing up. There are all these distinct points above the main note. There are more and more of them, and they get closer together as you go higher, but also, once you get past a certain point, they start to tail off. Notice that with the guitar sound, a lot of the lower harmonics are stronger than in the clarinet. Actually, the guitar's first harmonic, no wait, it's first overtone. The fundamental counts as a harmonic, and that's the one difference between the terms harmonic and overtone. The guitar's first overtone, technically the second harmonic, is stronger than the fundamental it looks like. But now let's see what happens if I put a brick wall EQ curve there and start sweeping down. Now both of them sound basically identical. We're just hearing that pure fundamental F tone. If your mind isn't blown yet, I don't know what to tell you. You're, you're difficult to impress or you already knew about this and why are you watching? Now here's an interesting thing. Overtones don't have their own overtones. Unlike the fundamental, they are pure tones without their own harmonic series. They'll sound kind of like our guitar and clarinet did when we filtered all of the harmonics away down to just the fundamental. It's a very simple, dull, plain tone. A tone that has no harmonics is a sine wave. Therefore, all harmonics are sine waves. Now what the f is a sine wave? A sine wave is the purest tone possible. It truly is just a single pitch. It's one perfect wave visualized amazingly in this video about Fourier analysis by Smarter Every Day. If we were to turn this circle on and watch it go up and down and up and down and trace that motion out, 
you get what's called a sine wave. Fascinating video, I highly recommend it if you wanna understand more about waveforms and how they interact. So, if we have a musical note and we strip away all the overtones and are just left with the fundamental, that is a sine wave. We've also learned that overtones don't have overtones themselves because they're all also sine waves. So that means that any consistent pitch played on any instrument can be recreated just with the right combination of sine waves. Once again, <laughs> let's quickly hop back into Ableton here. I've got the operator synth open, which is an FM synth, but it also lets you do what's called additive synthesis, which is adding sine waves together. So let's play a C and it's just gonna do a sine wave here. Now what operator lets you do here in this kind of graph looking area is add individually any of the first 64 harmonics. So I'm gonna hold down this note and then I'll add the first few overtones and you can hear what that sounds like. Now here's an interesting phenomenon. The first bunch of harmonics make up a major chord. And so when you add them one by one like that, it sounds like you're making a chord. But if I now play a scale with this sound where all the harmonics are moving along with each note, you don't really notice it anymore. It sounds like an individual note with some overtones. Let's try again, just adding harmonics at random and making a really weird dissonant chord. Like that doesn't seem to sound good when you're just listening to the sine waves individually being added on. But if you, again, play a melody with it, it just sounds like a synth with a particular timbre. So using different combinations of harmonics is one way that through synthesis, we can approximate real world instruments. That's like kind of trumpety, obviously would need a bit more work, but you can hear the beginnings of that. What if we have very few lower harmonics and then add a bunch of higher ones? Get a really buzzy sound. Do some other stuff at random. So these can be the starting points for so many different timbres, which you can then further shape with other filtering or uh, envelopes, you know, affecting how things change over time, affecting how the volume changes. Mind blown. If I'm blowing your mind right now, please leave a comment because uh, I just remember when I learned about this as a little baby student and my brain was on the floor. <laughs> there are of course plenty of things that don't vibrate at a consistent pitch. So the sounds that they make don't invoke the harmonic series. And with any real world object, there will be imperfections that may contaminate the harmonic series. So for instance, that's why old guitar strings sound worse than new ones. When they're worn or damaged in different places, it means the string can't vibrate perfectly symmetrically. And so instead of getting the pure harmonic series, the sound will be a little bit noisier. <laughs> I hope you're still with me because we've only covered the first reason why the harmonic series is so mind blowing. So musical notes are just collections of interacting sine waves. Doesn't matter what instrument you're playing, if it's a pitched instrument, it's a complex sine wave generator. It might also be making some other sounds, like for instance, on a guitar, before the note actually sounds, you'll probably have a bit of the click or the scrape of the pick against the string. Those are inharmonic sounds and all those little details add to the unique character of any given instrument. But the second mind blowing thing about the harmonic series is that it's the foundation of all the chords and scales that we use. It's the reason why certain notes sound good together. It wasn't just that someone back in the day decided on a scale that they liked and we all agreed to it and are using it out of habit. It's that the physical laws of the universe determined what these note relationships would be. Long before music existed, long before humans even existed, any resonant body vibrating at a consistent frequency would also include harmonics, would include those integer multiples of that bass frequency. Let's have a listen to the series again. As you can hear and see in this notation, the pitches of the harmonic series correspond with the notes and intervals used in the vast majority of music. If this low C is our fundamental, then the first overtone, the vibration that's twice as fast as that, is this C an octave up. And then the vibration that's three times as fast as that is the G above that. Four times faster is another C, five times faster is an E, and so on. So first we're going up by an octave, and then from that note we're going up by a fifth, from there up by a fourth, 
then a major third, a minor third, another minor third, and then switching clefs here, we go up a major second, major second, major second. So for instance, if we play a C, look at how many C overtones we have. If we play an E with a C, well, there's a bunch of E's in the overtone series on C. And then in the overtone series on E, there's gonna be all those E octaves. So you've got a lot of, a lot of alignment that sounds good to us. And the reason why these intervals sound good together is because our ears are doing math. An octave is two notes vibrating at a two to one ratio. The next simplest whole number ratio is a perfect fifth, three to two. A perfect fourth is a four to three ratio. Notes sound consonant. They sound nicely harmonized to us when the math is the easiest. Not only that, but when two notes related by this series are played together, they will share a lot of overlapping overtones. Now there is just one little wrench to throw in the equation. Let's get this diagram back up. To see these numbers across the top, those represent how many cents sharp or flat the notes underneath them are compared to equal temperament. <laughs> That's why some of the notes were colored. The bluer they are, the flatter they are, the redder they are, the sharper they are. Now let me be clear, harmonics occur naturally and they sound like that example we've been playing throughout this video. What this diagram is showing is notes that are slightly out of tune compared to a human-made tuning system called equal temperament. What we found is that if we transposed the most audible harmonics, the first 30 or so overtones, into one octave, they would correspond pretty closely to 12 equally spaced divisions of that octave. Closely, but not perfectly. When you tune everything to 12 perfect divisions of an octave, that's equal temperament, and it's what most of the music you hear nowadays will be tuned to. The reason for this is consistency. With overtones, every note that isn't an octave of the fundamental is slightly out of tune compared to its equal temperament counterpart. That means that once you start making even slightly complex music, if you're tuned to the perfect ratios of the harmonic series, then some of your intervals will be out of tune with each other. For instance, let's look at the first major thirds that occur in the harmonic series on C. We have a C to an E here. So the fourth and fifth harmonics, uh, a five to four ratio. The C is perfectly in tune because it's an octave of the fundamental. The E though is 14 cents flat compared to what it would be in equal temperament. Let's have a listen to the subtle difference between these two thirds. The next major third is this B flat going to this D. Now this B flat, which is a perfect seven to one ratio going to our C fundamental, is already 31 cents flatter than an equal temperament B flat. So if we want a pure five four ratio major third up from this B flat, it should be a D that is 14 cents even flatter than this. So a D that is 45 cents flat. But this D, which is a perfect nine to one ratio from our fundamental, is four cents sharp. So look what's happening with these ratios. On our first major third, this C and E, we have a five to four ratio. The B flat to the D is a nine to seven ratio. It's similar, but it's slightly off. If it were 10 to eight, of course, it would be perfect because that's an exact doubling of five to four. And as you can see here on our eighth and 10th harmonics, we again have that C and E. So if you were writing a piece that went from a C major chord to a B flat major chord, you would have two different sounding major thirds there. You'd also have a completely different interval moving the whole tone from the B flat to the C, where the first note is 31 cents flat, than you would moving from the C to the D, also a whole tone, but the second note is four cents sharp. Equal temperament divides the octave equally so that every whole tone is the same as every other whole tone. Any given major third is the same spacing as any other major third. It's a tuning system of compromise so that every possible interval or chord change in any key sounds equally in tune, or depending on how you wanna look at it, equally out of tune. And now that I've made this video, I realize why so many music programs probably skip over it because it just opens so many cans of worms. Now I feel like I gotta explain how much we're culturally trained to hear equal temperament, how live musicians often naturally make adjustments to get certain notes closer to just intonation. It's the reason why very professional, highly trained choirs will still sometimes end up a little sharper or flatter than where they started. It's why tuning a guitar's B string is so annoying. That major third, man. You should definitely look more into all this if it's piqued your interest, but at any rate, I hope now you know, if you didn't already, why music is the way that it is.
Love to hear your comments. Subscribe and turn on notifications to keep up with my music content. And I'll see you next time.